Hey guys, this video is hopefully going to be a bit faster and have more cat gifts. So let's get started. Uh, let's say you have a fly right here named Marty McFly, the physics fly, and he is traveling in a circle. He has a tangential velocity, it's tangent to the path, we'll call that V, and a centripetal acceleration, we'll call that AC. These things are perpendicular to each other, uh, and I can use these information, this information to find out what the centripetal force is. It's going to be the mass times the centripetal acceleration, uh, or I can write that as V squared over R because the centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. But sometimes it's hard to identify what the centripetal force is, so we need a couple of examples to help us kind of wrap our minds around that. So let's pretend that Marty McFly has multiple forces acting on him. Maybe one force like this, we'll call that F1, pointing in towards the center of the circle. Another force, we'll call that F2, pointing out. And perhaps there are some tangential forces or forces that are trying to pull the fly clockwise and counterclockwise. Here's how we would organize these forces uh, if we were trying to write equations for net force. Um, so let's deal with the centripetal forces too. The centripetal forces are the forces that point either toward the center or away from the center. And we would sum them like this. F1 points in, so we make it positive, And F2 points out, so we make it negative. Okay, so that would be how you sum the centripetal forces. F4 and F3 are tangential forces, so we could write them as sigma Ft, and we would say that anything that's counterclockwise is positive, so that would be F3, uh, and then we would subtract anything that's clockwise, like F4. Now, we probably aren't going to be using this. Um, in a situation where you would need a tangential force, is if, for example, this fly was tied to a string and then you put like a little bottle rocket or something on top of it or connected to the fly and then that shot a bunch of flames and so it just went faster and faster and faster and faster around the circle. Uh, but we probably won't deal with that kind of a question. Instead, what we're more interested in are these centripetal forces because we know that the centripetal forces will always add up to mv squared over r. And in this case, we would be able to write f1 minus f2 equals mv squared over r. But for most of our problems, most of our problems, there's only going to be one force that points in, one centripetal force, and we just need to be able to identify what that centripetal force is. And figuring out what points in is essentially our goal. So let's, let's do an example. You swing a 3 kilogram ball tied to a 0.8 meter uh, string, which is a string, in such a way that it's nearly parallel to the ground when swinging in a circle. Okay, so what this means, nearly parallel to the ground, is that you can basically pretend that this ball is going in a horizontal circle, a perfect horizontal circle. And there is some tension in the rope. Um, the radius of this circle is the length of the string, so 0.8 meters. Uh, and later we'll talk about what to do if you're swinging the ball and it's not nearly parallel. It's actually kind of a angled a little bit, like a, a, a small pendulum, kind of where, like a cone, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so the ball is moving with a tangential velocity, we'll call that V, of 2 meters per second, and we need to find the tension in the string. So if I think about the tension in the string on the ball, the tension is going to be pointing in, towards the center, always, just kind of like um, the lab we did where we were trying to find the tension in the string of the object that was going in a circle. So that is, for us, the centripetal force. The tension is the centripetal force. So sometimes, off to the side, I'll write this, okay? The centripetal force is tension. I've identified it, good. Now what I can do is say, okay, well, I know that the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. Therefore, tension is equal to mv squared over r. And all you need to do for this problem is plug in the variables that they give you. So three kilograms, a velocity of 2 meters per second squared, and then I'll divide all of that by the radius of 0.8 meters. Uh, when all is said and done, you should get 15 newtons for the tension in the string. All right, let's do another example. Okay, here you have a 1,500 kilogram car driving in a circle on flat ground. Um, I'm going to draw a kind of top view or a bird's eye view of that. Just a car, congratulations, here's your car, windows or something, I don't know. And it's going in a circle, which looks like a bean. Uh, there is a radius to this circle of 30 meters. 
Great. Uh, and you were told the kinetic coefficient of friction between the road and the tires is 0.5. The static coefficient of friction, I'm going to underline that, is 0.6. If the radius is 30 meters, what is the speed of the car? So this wants us to find for the car that tangential or that linear speed. So how do we find that? Well, we know that the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. So if we can identify what the centripetal force is, then maybe there's some way for us to put an amount to it and then use it to solve for the velocity squared. Um, so to think about what the centripetal force is, I'm actually going to draw the picture from a front view. Uh, kind of like if you were playing Mario Kart and you turned the camera so that it looked at you while you were driving. Okay, so if we take a front view of what's happening, uh, here's the car. It's got tires, fantastic. This is sort of like a Bob Ross moment for everybody. There's the car, there's you, you're happy. Here's your family, everyone's excited, and your dog. Congratulations, got some headlights, little grill, okay. Uh, if you were on the ground, you would have the normal forces that we associate, so the weight and the normal force. And if you're going in a circle, then the force that you can use to turn is friction. Think of it like this. If you were on ice, would you be able to drive in a circle, or would you just keep going straight and maybe spin out? And keep going in a straight line while spinning around your own axis, but you're actually not driving in a circle. So for this problem, it's kind of hard to see, but the centripetal force is friction. So I'm going to write that down. The centripetal force is the force of friction. Now that's good because I also know the centripetal force is the mass times velocity squared over the radius, therefore friction is equal to mass times velocity squared over the radius. Now it would be easy for us to find what the velocity is if we can find the force of friction. And thankfully it's easy to find the force of friction in this problem. We know that friction is always going to be the coefficient mu times the normal force. And in this problem, we know the normal force is equal to the weight. Now, the force of friction we're supposed to use, um, you might actually think that it's kinetic, but you would use kinetic friction if the car tires were sliding across the ground, like if you were skidding or doing donuts. Um, but the way car tires are designed is that they stick to the ground, so you have lots of traction. So you actually are supposed to use the static coefficient, coefficient of friction of 0.6. So I'm going to write S just to make sure I don't forget that I need static. Okay, so what I can do now is take this equation for friction and set it equal. Actually, I have to plug in mg first. Set it equal to mv squared over r. Okay, so now hopefully you notice something that you don't need to use for the problem. If they did not tell you what the mass of this car was, you wouldn't need it. So make a note that you actually don't need the mass of the car because it cancels, it goes away. And the coefficient of friction times the acceleration due to gravity is equal to v squared over r. Now solving for the velocity, you just multiply both sides by r. So you're going to get mu s times g r. And then you do the square root. Okay, This is the type of answer that you would need to pick for an AP question. And when we plug in our numbers, we're going to get 0.6 times 10 meters per second squared times 30 meters. Plug all of that in and you will get 13.4 meters per second. You're doing great. Keep it up. All right. Oh, and you know what? I promised you more cat gifts. So here's one that shows you working on all of your practice problems and homework. Congratulations. All right. Third problem. Ooh, this one's weird. At an amusement park, there is a ride in which a cylindrically shaped chamber spins around a centripetal axis. Wow, I am really, really bad at writing. Can you see all those? A, I don't need to get that in there. Shaped chamber, no, okay, spins great. Around a central axis. People sit in seats facing the axis, their backs against the outer wall. While the ride is spinning, riders are stuck to the wall. Okay, if you don't know what this ride is called, sometimes this ride is called the Gravitron, um, or other times it's called a rotor. We will take a look at, I'm sorry, I mean a video of it. Um, it sometimes looks like this. So there are ones that kind of spin, they tilt, and they go around. Really fun, exciting stuff. Uh, here is a, here's a good example of one where it actually doesn't go at an angle. It just moves horizontally, and then the floor drops out. If you notice, 
this little kid right here is about to pass out. Getting there, he's having a good time, she's clapping. Oh, almost there, almost there, and he's gone. Okay. So, your parents aren't that bad. All right, now, in this problem, if we think about what it feels like being on the wall, it's kind of hard to recognize this, but basically, nothing is pushing you out. It's that the wall is keeping you from flying away in a straight line. That force that's keeping you from flying away in a straight line is normal to the surface of the wall, so we call it a normal force. You will also have the weight or the force of gravity acting down on you, so that means you need to be on a wall that has a lot of friction that can act up. Okay, so these are our forces for this problem. You know, as long as you're not accelerating up, that friction is actually, in this problem, um, equal or balanced with the weight. So it's an important thing. Let's write that. F equals mg. Now you also know that friction equals mu times the normal force, um, which this is kind of weird. Think about this for a second. So if you wanted to, you could say what the normal force was in, tar in terms of mu and F, where the normal force is actually friction divided by mu, which is the same thing as saying mg over mu. Okay, so this is the normal force. Now, let's talk about why I did that. In this problem, the normal force is your centripetal force because the wall is what's constantly changing your direction as you go in a circle. Okay, so because the normal force is the wall, or I'm sorry, the centripetal force is the normal force from the wall, you can actually set that equal to mv squared over r. And again, why this is important is because we know that the normal force is equal to uh, mg over mu, which is really good for us because we actually don't care that this person is 83 kilograms. It's unimportant to us because we can cross out the mass. Now, since this person is not sliding across the wall, we only need to use the static coefficient of friction. And um, since they don't give us a kinetic coefficient of friction, we're, we're not going to write it. But if they did, we wouldn't want to use it. Uh, but what we want to do is find the radius of the ride. So let's solve this equation. G over mu equals V squared over R. Let's solve that, solve that for the radius. Uh, you multiply both sides by R. So you get R G over mu equals v squared, uh, and then you divide both sides by g and multiply both sides by mu. So divide both sides by g, multiply both sides by mu. Okay, so this would be an equation that you would use on the AP test. Uh, now I have everything that we need. We've got 10 meters per second, got the coefficient of friction, and I know g is 10, so 10 meters per second, sorry, the whole thing squared, uh, times mu, which is 0.4, and then we divide that whole thing by 10 meters per second squared. And this comes out to 4 meters. So congratulations, you just solved some really hard physics problems. You should be really proud. So why don't you uh, go tell your mom and dad how awesome you are at physics and that you got all your homework done. Congratulations.